Good morning, Watermark Fort Worth. For those of you joining us here this morning, <clears throat> and for those of you joining us online, I mean, I wish you guys need to sit in the front row and listen to yourself sing because it is awesome. Like it is seriously the best real estate in the house is right there. And so next week, sit on the front row. Pardon me one second. <clears throat> Excuse me. Hey, so we're going to continue in the study of the book of Luke this morning in chapter 13. So you can go ahead and turn there. But as you do that, I want to introduce you to a friend of mine uh, who serves on the porch team with me along with 35 other young adults. Uh, and so let me, introduce, let me introduce to you Claudia Royale. Why don't you go ahead and come on up? You guys give Claudia a big round of applause. I wanted Claudia to share her story of grace with you this morning. Hi, my name is Claudia, and this is the story of how Christ transformed my life. From a young age, I carried the weight of expectation growing up in a Catholic household where faith was measured by actions and adherence to tradition. I was the eldest sibling tasked with setting an example, which meant my life was a balancing act of maintaining the image of the good kid while navigating my own desires and the pressures of adolescence. This internal conflict led me to a double life, the perfect daughter at home, and a seeker of acceptance through risky behaviors elsewhere. In my late teens, I continued to struggle with my identity and worth by engaging in an inappropriate relationship, and my life took a significant turn at 19 when I found myself pregnant. Fearing disappointment and judgment from my family, I chose to have an abortion, a decision that haunted me with guilt and sadness and propelled me into years of substance abuse and partying as a means of escape. Despite me living for the world, I knew, I, was missing, I knew something was missing in my life, and I made a superficial decision to be a Christian, believing in God but living contrary to his teachings. My early marriage was marred by infidelity on my part, which was evidence of my ongoing battle with sin and self-deception. The sudden suicide of my brother was a stark wake-up call. Confronted with my own suicidal thoughts and the deep grief of loss, I was forced to face the reality of my spiritual and emotional imprisonment. This tragedy, however, marked the beginning of my journey towards healing. Seeking professional help and opening up about my mental health struggles were my first steps out of the darkness. Relocating from California to Texas marked a new chapter for my husband and me. It was here in the midst of marital difficulties that we discovered re-engage. 1 John 1.9 says, If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. The conviction to confess my past adultery to my husband was a pivotal moment of surrender to God, leading to freedom in Christ and the beginning of genuine faith. Despite my hopes for reconciliation, my marriage ended in divorce. Yet this period of my life was crucial in learning to trust God's timing and plan, a lesson that became clearer through my participation in regeneration. Each step of the program, particularly the challenging task of inventorying my sins, forced me to confront the depth of my wrongdoing and the impact of my actions. This process, though painful, was essential for my spiritual growth and understanding of God's grace. My journey through Regen not only brought healing, but also allowed me to share my story and the hope of Christ with others. Through Regen and reading God's word, I learned the importance of community, vulnerability, and the transformative power of living a life aligned with God's will. By God's grace, over the past three years, I've seen the value of genuine faith, the power of confession, and the beauty of God's redemption. Through my trials, including the loss of my brother, God has shown me how to use my pain for a greater purpose, offering hope and sharing the gospel with those in despair. In closing, the testimony that God has given me is a reminder of the transformative power of Christ's love and forgiveness. It is a journey from darkness to light, from bondage to freedom, and a testament to the healing and restorative power of the gospel. 2 Corinthians 5.17 says, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. Thank you for letting me share. Amen. <laughs> Man, God is so faithful, and he deserves all the glory. Jesus came to 
bring liberty to the captives and to set free the oppressed and to bind up the brokenhearted, did he not? Her story sets a really great backdrop for the text that we're going to be looking at this morning. And the text that we're looking at is going to be Jesus' last sermon in the synagogue before he goes to the cross. And he's, the first sermon he gave, so the first sermon he gave was in Luke 4 when he was in the synagogue. And this is what he read from Isaiah 61. And he said, The Spirit of the Lord is on me because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. And he has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind, to set the oppressed free, and to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Jesus has come to establish his kingdom on the earth. And his kingdom is not a kingdom that you might expect. His kingdom is for the broken and the downcast and for the rejected. Jesus came not for those who had it all together, but he came to call those who were humble and teachable. Jesus has come to liberate those who've been held captive by addiction and self-centeredness and self-righteousness. Jesus has come to liberate the captive and to give him eternal life. You know, there's a lot of us in here this morning that I know of that have some real hardship in their life right now. Some of us are struggling with severe health issues, battling depression, marital conflicts, and relational loss. Jesus has come to bind up the brokenhearted. Jesus has come to liberate those who are oppressed with anxiety and depression and fear. And the main idea this morning that I want to explore in the text is that Jesus has come to bring a kingdom But the kingdom of God doesn't look exactly like we would expect. The kingdom of God is smaller and more humble than you may expect. And yet it's powerful and it's pervasive. Two points this morning. The first one we're going to look at is that the kingdom of God is for the broken and the bent over souls. And the second one is that the kingdom of God works in subtle but powerful ways. Let me just pray for us again, then we're going to jive into the text. Father, pray this morning that you would speak through your word powerfully. God, would you unleash what we need to hear through your word, and may you bind up the brokenhearted and help set uh, the captives free. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. All right, Luke chapter 13, verse 10, going through verse 21, it says, and he was teaching in one of the synagogues. On the Sabbath, and there was a woman who for 18 years had had a sickness caused by a spirit. And she was bent double and could not straighten up at all. When Jesus saw her, he called her over and said to her, Woman, you're freed from your sickness. And he laid his hands on her, and immediately she was made erect again and began glorifying God. But the synagogue official, indignant because Jesus had healed on the Sabbath, began saying to the crowd in response, There are six days in which work should be done. Come during them and get healed, and not on the Sabbath day. But the Lord answered him and said, You hypocrites, does not each of you on the Sabbath untie his ox or his donkey from the stall and lead him away to water him? And this woman, a daughter of Abraham, as she is, whom Satan has bound for 18 long years, should she not have been released from this bond on the Sabbath day? And as he said this, all his opponents were being humiliated, and the entire crowd was rejoicing over all the glorious things being done by him. So he was saying, what is the kingdom of God like, and what, and to what shall I compare it? It's like a mustard seed, which a man took and threw into his own garden, and it grew and became a tree. And the birds of the air nested in its branches. And again, he said, to what shall I compare the kingdom of God? It is like leaven, which a woman took and hid in three pecks of flour until it was all leavened. So the first point this morning is that the kingdom of God is for broken and bent over souls. Now, this particular Sabbath day, Jesus was teaching, and a woman came in who was severely afflicted physically, spiritually, and psychologically. It said she had a sickness for 18 years. Can you imagine that? having a sickness for 18 years that you just feel powerless to do anything about. It says that she was bent over double. So she was like a walking right angle. And she was incapable of doing anything to stand up at all. I mean, just imagine that. You, you try to stand up 
and you can't move at all. Imagine how hard it would be to get around. I know that for many of you, maybe your husband's a pilot or uh, your spouse works as an EMS or you know, maybe like my wife, her husband's a pastor and it's really hard to get to church on Sundays when you have however many kids and it's really difficult, right? Imagine what it would be like for this woman to try to get to Sunday worship every Sunday or every Saturday for the Sabbath being completely bent over like a right angle. Try to imagine what it would be like to sleep in her condition. The text actually tells us that her sickness was caused by a spirit, which is really interesting. And so the significance of that in this particular text is that she was oppressed, that she was helpless in her situation, and that medical medical techniques were going to be useless to her. See, there's many in this room, and I know that many of you can identify with feeling broken physically and relationally. Now, physically, you may not be bent over double, so to speak, but you're in a lot of physical pain, and you feel helpless to do anything about the health condition that you've worked so hard to try to solve. Or relationally, maybe you're not completely alone, but maybe you feel like your marriage is completely bent out of shape. I got to call this woman from a first, as a first impression, somebody who was just looking for help. And she called and I answered the phone and she said, I need help. I'm so tired of seeing other women's phone numbers pop up on my, on my husband's cell phone. What do I do? She just felt completely helpless to do anything about her marriage. Well, maybe your husband's not running around on you, but you just feel completely helpless. Or maybe you feel like your child is on an autobahn of rebellion and that he is just moving or she is moving at breakneck speeds as fast as he or she can away from God, and it feels like there is nothing you can do. That's the state of this woman. She's helpless, and yet she keeps coming week after week, trusting and hoping that God would see her and that he would do something about her circumstances. So what happens next? In verse 12, check this. It says, and Jesus saw her. Jesus saw her. She probably was wondering for a long time, does God even see me? Does God even care? And what I want to say to you this morning is is that Jesus sees you. Jesus sees your physical pain. He sees your rebellious child. He sees how your marriage is completely bent out of shape. And just like Jesus was pursuing this woman, I can promise you this morning that Jesus is pursuing you. In verse 12, it says, he called her over and he said to her, woman, you are freed from your sickness. And he laid hands on her and immediately she was made erect again and began glorifying God. Now notice, what does Jesus do for her? He calls her to him. She didn't even come looking for Jesus to heal her. He just sees her. It's almost as if he had been waiting for her to arrive. And when she comes in, he's like, there she is. I've been waiting for her. And he calls her over and And he heals her, and he demonstrates the power over the spiritual forces of evil that have oppressed her and have made her sick for 18 long years. And he speaks over her with the same power that created God, created the universe, or the same power that he raises Lazarus from the dead. He uses that same power to speak over her. And he's pursuing her. So he calls her, he heals her, and he's pursuing her, and he shows her compassion when he, he not only speaks over her, but he lays his hands on her as a form of compassion and mercy. Now, this next part is not explicitly in the text, but I like to imagine that when Jesus healed her, that he reached down and he grabbed her chin, and being in her state, she would have not been able to look people in the eyes because she would always been staring at the ground And I like to imagine that he kind of lifts her head up and he looks her right in the eyes and that he's the first person that she's made eye contact with in 18 long years. And he says, I see you. See, Jesus is, is pursuing her. Now, what happens next is really crazy if you think about it. And the point that I want to explore in this next part here is, is that idolatry blinds us from seeing and cherishing the work of Christ around us. Idolatry blinds us from seeing and cherishing the work of Christ around us. I'll read the verses again, verse 14. 
But the synagogue official, indignant because Jesus had healed on the Sabbath, began saying to the crowd in response, there are six days in which you should, work should be done. So come during them and get healed and not on the Sabbath day. So the synagogue leader is indignant or he's angry with Jesus that he's healed on the Sabbath. And the reason he did this is because Jesus has broken the man-made protocols of how one should function on the Sabbath. He's frustrated and angry at Jesus because Jesus has healed on the Sabbath. He thinks that Jesus has broken the law of God by performing a miracle on the Sabbath. See, the the synagogue leaders and the Pharisees had created these laws and regulations around the Sabbath in order to prevent people from working. Because the law does state that men, that they should not work on the Sabbath. And so they loaded the Sabbath down with all these man-made rules and regulations, 39 of them to be exact. One of them I thought was particularly interesting, and that is that a, a man or woman should not spit on the Sabbath. Why? Because the idea was is that if spit landed in dirt, it would form mud, which is a form of plowing, which is a form of work. <laughs> so you can see the level of legalism that's happening here. And so he, they, he, they interpreted it as Jesus is working on the Sabbath, and that should not happen. And so the synagogue leader is really upset with Jesus. But notice what he says next. He says, there are six days in which work should be done. So come during them and get healed and not on the Sabbath day. So after Jesus displays his power and compassion of almighty God, and he heals a woman who's been afflicted for 18 long years, the first thing that comes to this man's mind is, Jesus just worked on the Sabbath. You've got to be kidding me. How could this man be so blind to the fact that the kingdom of God is at work right in front of him, and he's worked up into a tizzy about the fact that he thinks that Jesus has worked. How how could he miss this? Like, I mean, imagine this, that the woman who's been healed in the synagogue, and the synagogue leader stands up and says, listen up, everybody. There are six other days in the week that you can come and get healed. Don't be bringing your problems in here on Sunday, okay? That's essentially what he's saying. He's essentially saying, don't bring your problems in here. This is a place where we can come together and we can sing and we can read the text, but this is not a place where you should expect to be healed. I mean, imagine, let's just take this a little step further. Imagine if I said to you, you guys, if any of you have brought any problems in here, you better check those suckers at the door because this is not a place for you to come and get healed. You would be like, Zyler, you are totally missing the purpose of the kingdom of God. Like you are completely off your rocker. And that's exactly what is happening here. It's the exact opposite of what the kingdom of God is all about. The kingdom is for the oppressed and the downcast and the broken. See, the church is the perfect place for imperfect people. It's not a place to come in here and try to morally flex and show that you're a better person than other people. This just shows how hard-hearted and deceitful that this man has become through his sin. But let's talk about this for a little bit. How could he be so blinded by his sin? And the answer is idolatry. He's blinded by idolatry. You see, idolatry blinds us to the work of God that's happening around us, and it robs us of our affections for the work of God. This man loves his traditions, and I mean he truly loves his ideology. Obeying the rules is his number one priority in life. What is idolatry? Idolatry is when you take a good thing and you make it an ultimate thing. Idolatry is when you make something the number one priority in your life. Idolatry is when a person shifts one's priorities from what is truly important to God to reflect what is truly important to the individual. And since you functionally love your idol most, you prioritize and you invest your energy and time into it more than anything else. Idolatry is extremely blinding because it has captured your affections. Idolatry is blinding because it has captured your affections, and they say that love is blind. Why do you think the Aggies think that they're going to be good every year? (laughs) And I'm an Aggie. 
right? We have been bad since 97, you know, or actually 2000. And yet, it's because we're blinded by love, by our idolatry of being an Aggie. <clears throat> but in all seriousness, though, let's just kind of look at some of these idols. If your idol is material wealth and status, then you're going to love cars and clothes and houses and stuff. And as a result, you're going to fail to meet the needs of those around you because you've spent all of your resources on yourself. Or maybe your idol is technology and social media. You'll be distracted from real world relationships and opportunities to be fully present. Last season, I was at my son's t-ball game and there weren't many people there, but there were these two grandparents that were sitting in front of us and they were absolutely glued to their devices. <clears throat> My dad was at the game, and I guess he, I guess this was, you know, put some sand in his crawl, and he got up, and he was like, what's so important on those devices that you're uh, missing a good game here? <clears throat> you should have seen their responses. They were like, ah, You know, I thought to myself, I was like, you know, devices aren't just an idol for the young, but they're also for the old. I mean, just go to a park and just see how many pe parents are just completely captivated by what's going on in their devices. Maybe your idol is career and professional success. So you work excessive hours at the expense of making disciples and serving in the church. Or maybe your, your idol is personal comfort and convenience. And so you miss opportunities to love others because you really don't want to self-sacrifice out of fear that it's going to be uncomfortable. The point is, is that our idols blind us and they rob us of what's actually most important. You see, many of you, if you're honest with yourself, you don't even really care about the things of God. Maybe you once did, but maybe you've slowly drifted. Why is that? Why have you ceased to care so much about the things of God when you once did? It's because your idols are robbing you of your holy affections. They've taken over the throne of your life and now you, you serve them more than serving and celebrating the things of God that are happening in you and in those around you. That's what's happened to the synagogue leader. His affections, his holy affections have been hijacked by tradition. Now let's look at how Jesus responds to the religious leader. It says, but the Lord answered him and said, you hypocrites, does not each of you on the Sabbath untie his ox or his donkey from the stall and lead him away to water him? And this woman, a daughter of Abraham as she is, whom Satan bound for 18 long years, should she not have been released from her bond on this Sabbath day? Jesus basically just speaks common sense into the situation and says, you untie your donkey on the Sabbath and feed it and water it. The key word here is, is you unbound, you unbind your donkey. But this woman who's been bound by Satan is healed and liberated and you have an issue with it. Do you see how hypocritical and how lost you've become? And then it says in verse 17, all his opponents were being humiliated and the entire crowd was rejoicing over all the glorious things being done by him. In other words, Jesus put the religious leader in his place. And Jesus has now rightly defined the Sabbath as a day of rejoicing, of freedom and liberation, a day for the downcast and the broken. And that day, that Sabbath day, really is pointing to the future. It's pointing, it's a picture of what, when, what happens when the kingdom of God fully and ultimately comes on this earth because every day in the kingdom of God is like Sabbath day. And they're rejoicing because they have a context for what the Sabbath represented that we have a hard time understanding. But it was a day to rejoice and to celebrate because God was at work and he was doing something magnificent. And so in application, I just want to speak to those two different audiences. Let's speak first to the, those who feel like they're struggling with idolatry. Let me ask you a question. What is really most important in your life? What's really most important in your life? Is it your career? Is your excessive focus on your career blinding you to the most important relationship in your life, which is Jesus, and the relationships of your family? Or maybe it's material wealth, or earthly possessions 
blinding you to the need of those who are around you? Or maybe it's entertainment and comfort. Are you overly focused on self? Your idolatry is suffocating your love for God. If you're wondering why you don't feel like you're experiencing God like you used to, and maybe you don't, key here is that you don't love him like you used to, it's likely because you're feasting on some created thing as an ultimate thing rather than God. To speak to those who feel that they're bent over and broken, here's my encouragement to you. Keep coming to Jesus. Just like the woman who kept coming on the Sabbath year after year after year, keep drawing near to him and he will draw near to you. Bring your afflictions to Jesus. Matthew eleven twenty eight says, come to me, come, all who are burdened and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. He is pursuing you, and he desires to heal you. So don't lose heart. Just like Jesus saw the woman and called her to free her in her affliction, Jesus sees you, he's pursuing you, and he is healing you. Philippians 1.6 says it this way, and I am sure of this, I am sure of this, that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Christ. He will bring it to completion. That's the beautiful thing is, is that when you stand before God, even though you're a work in progress now, that there's a day when you stand before God and you are going to be fully clothed in the righteousness of Christ and all of your sin struggles, your idolatry, and or all of the wounds and the hurtful things that have happened will all be healed in a moment. And so I am sure of this, that he who began a good work in you, he will see it to completion. And it's a guarantee that it will definitely happen at the day of the Lord if it doesn't happen on this side of eternity. Which brings us to the second point, and that is that the kingdom of God works in subtle but powerful ways. So how should I expect to experience the kingdom of God? How should we expect it to enter into our lives? Let's read the verses 8 through 18 through 21 again. So he was saying, what is the kingdom of God like? And to what shall I compare it? It is like a mustard seed, which a man took and he threw it into his garden and it grew and it became a tree. And the birds of the air nested in its its branches. And again, he said, to what shall I compare the kingdom of God? It is like leaven, which a woman took and hid in three pecks of flour until it was all leavened. So, in order to understand this parable, we need to look more closely at verse 18 when it says, so he was saying. Because see, in the Greek, the beginning of verse 18 contains the word therefore. It doesn't show up on the text, but in the Greek, it does. And any time you see the word therefore, you need to ask, what's it there for, right? Therefore, at the beginning of 18, it links the story of the woman being healed and the parable Jesus is about to tell us. What this means is, is that Jesus is about to explain to us how we can expect the kingdom of God to come into our lives. Is it going to come into our lives? Should we expect the kingdom to come into our lives immediately and dramatically, just like it did with this woman who was healed in dramatic and immediate ways? Or is the kingdom of God something more subtle than that as it enters our lives and as it moves through the world? Let's look. So Jesus compares the kingdom of God to a mustard seed and to leaven. So the kingdom of God is not exactly as you would expect. It's not an apocalyptic power or a political power. Uh, It's not like the kingdoms of of this world which rise to power suddenly and spectacularly only to just kind of vanish in the blink of an eye. The kingdom of God is like a mustard seed or leaven. What he's saying is, is that it's small and humble. It's powerful and it's provisional. The kingdom of God grows slowly and almost imperceptibly to the eye if you stare at it. Just like a mustard seed, though, over time, it contains potential for powerful growth. 
And like leaven, it has the potential to transform everything like yeast can transform in flour into bread. That is the way the kingdom of God works. And if you give it time, it will transform everything. See, the point of the parable of the leaven is this. It's to show the transformational power of the gospel in the heart of the believer. It's to show the transformational power of the gospel in the heart of the believer. The key word in the metaphor is the word hid. It's like leaven, which the woman took and hid into the flour until it was all leavened. The parable of the leaven is about sanctification. Jesus used the parable to explain how, the gospel, how through the gospel, the power of the Holy Spirit has transformational power in a person's life. Just follow the illustration. Imagine if you take a big batch of dough and you pack in just a tiny little bit of yeast and you mix it with the dough. At first, you can't even see the yeast because it's so small and imperceivable to the eye because it's hidden inside. But given some time, a small bit of yeast will work all the way through the dough, making the entire batch rise and ultimately transform it into an entirely new substance, which is bread. The point of the parable is that it serves as a metaphor of our sanctification. I want to give you a little illustration from my own personal life, okay, of how the kingdom of God has been working in my life. Ever since I can remember, I have struggled with a deep desire to prove myself through my performance. And even though I became a Christian at a young age, my whole life I've struggled with the tendency of looking to my accomplishments to validate me, to prove that I have what it takes. In the words of Rocky Balboa, I just have to prove that I'm not, I'm not another bum from the neighborhood. <laughs> this has been an area that God has been sanctifying me for years. And even though I received Christ at a young age, I've struggled uh, to looking at my performance for my significance. My struggle became even more pronounced around the age of 11 when I experienced an abuse from a trusted person in my life that left me feeling confused and ashamed. I believed the lie that I was a failure and that if anybody knew what had happened, that they would reject me. And as a result, I decided to keep this a secret from everybody in my life. Little did I know that keeping it a secret would have subtle but damaging effects on my life. And I began to double down on looking to my accomplishments to give me a sense of significance and to prove to myself and to others that I wasn't a failure. Throughout my teen years and into adulthood, I continued, continually found new idols to look to in order to give my life significance. While God still had a lot to do in my heart, though, God was beginning to, to break through my prideful exterior and to show me that he loved me and accepted me, even when I did feel like I was a failure. Philippians 1.6 says that he who began a good work in you will see it to completion. God was so faithful to me in this season, and he was working in the shadows even when I couldn't perceive it. Now let's fast forward a little bit. I'm living in Nashville now, I'm in my late 20s, and I'm working at a church plant, and I'm engaged to my now wife, Christine. Engagement for us was hard. For almost 20 years, I had lived with the undealt with trauma, and it was beginning to catch up to me. And as we went through premarital counseling, we began having some significant friction in our relationship, and it was rooted in some of my undealt with past. There was a distinct moment when I thought, if I don't begin to deal with this trauma of my past, I'm going to sabotage this relationship. Simultaneously, I was going through a recovery ministry uh, through my church in Nashville, and, and through the help of living in true biblical community, I began to walk in the light for the first time and was completely transparent about my past with Christine and the guys in my community group. And this is when healing began. I was honest with Christine, and she didn't reject me. She didn't shame me, but she, re she, she received me, and she showed me the love of Christ. And as I sought out counseling, I continued to experience healing. After we got married, we moved to Fort Worth and started working at Watermark, uh, where God continued to work on me in this area of um, performance-based living. A few years ago, while we were at staff retreat, I was sharing some of my testimony, 
uh, particularly the, the hard parts connected to shame and regret and, and guilt. And Gary Stroop, uh, he asked me if I'd ever shared this with my parents, to which I said I hadn't. And he looked at me and he said, you should do that. And he knew my parents and he knew that they were God-fearing people who would respond well. And he just said, um, you know, it's important that the most important people in your life are able to speak unconditional love over you into the areas of your life that are broken. And what probably was maybe the hardest thing I ever did I shared it with my parents, and it's been interesting to see uh, just the aftershock of healing that that brought. Uh, God is still at work in this area of my life. I mean, every time I preach or every time I am so susceptible to try to prove myself through my performance, <clears throat> I'll likely die with this struggle. Uh, but just like leaven working its way through the dough, God is working the gospel and its healing powers all throughout my life, and he will continue to do it until I stand before him. This is how the kingdom of God enters our lives. It's like leaven. It, it's the hidden heart change that happens gradually in the life of a believer over time. And this transformation, it takes time. If you stare at it, you won't, it won't even be perceivable to your eye. It's like botanical growth. That's why it's like a tree, is that it takes time for it to happen. But it's the nature of the kingdom of God is small and humble. So the kingdom of God is like leaven, but it's also like a mustard seed. The mustard seed showcases the, transformation, the transformational power of the gospel in the world, okay? So the leaven deals with our inner lives, the mustard seed, and I, I switched the order, we're gonna look at the world second, uh, or look at the mustard seed second, deals with the world. Consider a mustard seed. It's known to be one of the smallest seeds, and although it's small and humble, it holds tremendous power to grow into a large tree. Charles Spurgeon once reflected on the tremendous power of an acorn, okay? We got oak trees around here, so let's kinda look at that. A picture, of a, picture an acorn in your hand for a moment. At first glance, it seems small, like a, just a simple seed, but buried within its tiny package is incredible potential. Inside an acorn is the potential for a massive tree with huge branches and countless more acorns carrying the blueprint for an entire forest. This single acorn has the capacity to cover the world in a forest. This is what Jesus is teaching with the parable of the mustard seed. This little seed is small, but it has the potential to grow into something really powerful and incredibly providential and, uh, and provisional for people. Consider the beginnings of the gospel with me for a moment and how small they were. Its founder was a poor carpenter who was born of obs to a obscure high school girl in a remote part of the world, completely despised as he walked the earth. Jesus himself lived a life marked by simplicity removed from worldly wealth and status and ended up dying a criminal's death on a cross. The first followers of Christianity didn't even exceed a thousand people. And when Jesus left, its first preachers were fishermen who were unlearned, ignorant men. Not to mention the message of the kingdom was one of love and self-sacrifice. And yet Christianity has grown to encompass more than 2.3 billion people worldwide. Consider the fact that your life has been transformed by the life of this Nazarene. And your family's life and the trajectory of your family's life has been completely transformed by this Jewish man who lived in total obscurity. Consider the impact of the gospel on culture, equality, we believe that every person is equal in rank, race, religion, and gender. Where do you think that cultural idea came from? That's a thoroughly Christian idea that has permeated our culture. It's 
rooted in Genesis 1, 27, that all men are created in God's image. And it is this idea that has propelled social justice and civil rights in our nation. Or consider the cultural's embrace of compassion. We believe that society should be judged by how it treats its weakest member. Where do you think the value of compassion came from? How about the Good Samaritan? Which teaches that we should show mercy and kindness to all, regardless of social boundaries. Where do you think these cultural rights and our, uh, the cultural values that we just assume as part of our lives. These are deeply Christian ideas that are baked into the cake of our nation because of Christ. What do you think fuels the fight for the life of the unborn? A couple years ago, I was at a pregnancy help center fundraiser and there were hundreds of people there and the MC asked a question. They just said, hey, real quick, if you're here representing a church in Fort Worth, would you stand up? And it was like 90% of the room stood up. And I was just thinking, I was like, man, the kingdom is like a mustard seed. It started on the other side of the world, and it has grown into this force that is fighting for the unborn. It was just this beautiful picture. The kingdom of God is like a mustard seed, and it starts small and humble, but it works incredible power to provide not just for birds, but for weary souls. I mean, take Gary Stroop, Patrick and Joy Blocker, and Angela Artis. They were the first people to come over to Fort Worth to start this small but humble work of God in Fort Worth. And now look at us now. I'm just curious. I want you to raise your hand if in any way, shape, or form in your time here at Watermark Fort Worth, if you have experienced life-giving community, would you just raise your hand right now? I want you to look around. And then there's a whole nother service that's coming that are probably going to raise their hands as well. It started as small, and yet because of the sacrifice of small and the humble, God has been working incredible things, even in our community. And so in application, what does the leaven mean for us? It means that God is working in you. God is at work in you. It may not feel like it. It it may not even feel like he sees you, but the reality is he is at work in you. Philippians 1.6 is true, that He who began a good work in you will perfect it until the day of Christ Jesus. I read a different translation here. I read the NASB 95. Look at the word there. He who began a good work in you will perfect it until the day of Christ Jesus. He is working in you. He is working through the circumstances that has you bent over double. You can trust him. Keep going to him. What does the mustard seed mean for us? Well, God is at work through you. The mustard seed, the application of that is, is that God is at work through you. So keep investing your life in God's kingdom and just start small and humbly. I think oftentimes something that you could, um, something that's a little incriminating about millennials and Generation Z is that we only want to give to efforts that, Uh, obviously, that that show an immediate result. They show an immediate effect, you know. Uh, We we want to give to things that show like a microwavable fruit, if you will, right? But the reality is, is that the kingdom of God is slow and small, and the encouragement would be to just start small and make disciples. Stay-at-home moms, disciple your kids. 18 years, it's a long time but it'll go quick. And the fruit that will result is a a tree. Young adults who work at Lockheed and all over Fort Worth, because it feels like every young adult works at at Lockheed, make disciples where you are. Start a small group Bible study. Just share the gospel. High school students, be fully present in your school, whether it's a Christian school, because there's a lot of non-Christians at Christian schools, or you're at a public school. Share the gospel. 
Engage in conversation. Start a small group. Men, make disciples in your sphere of influence. Just start small. Invest in three guys. Do you know what would happen? And check my math on this. I checked it a couple times, but I probably made a mistake. Do you know what would happen if I made a, co a commitment for one year to invest in three guys, and then for after a year, those three guys went and invested in three guys, and, and we each continued the process, and we did that for 10 years? Do you know how many disciples would be made in, within 10 years? I came up with 88,573 people. If I just start with making th three disciples and each one of them multiply the process, over 88,000 people would be discipled. 88,000 marriages would be influenced. 88,000 idols, I'm, excuse me, not idols, I read the wrong thing there. 88,000 churches, <laughs> that's true, 88,000 idols might be smashed. <laughs> Think about how many churches would be planted. I can't stop thinking about how mad my, bad my math probably was, but the point is, is that the kingdom of God uh, is working in us and through us. And if we will open our hearts to God being at work in us, it starts with us. And the way that the kingdom moves is it just starts with us. And so let's pray. And I just want to give you a minute to pray and just ask the Lord to, to continue to do the good work that he is doing in and through you. Father, we just pray, would you help us, if, if any of us, if we have an idol, Lord, would you just reveal to us right now what the thing that we might be idolizing in our life? Help us to see the thing that's truly most important to us. And if you feel bent over and broken, would you just ask the Lord to draw near to you? Father God, would you work in us and through us would your Holy Spirit move in us like leaven or yeast moves through the dough? And by the power of the Holy Spirit, would you transform us to look and to be a completely new creature? Just like Claudia talked about at the beginning. Lord, would you make us to be people who, who truly worship you and don't worship our idols? Would the kingdom of God come into our hearts and invade us in such a way that as an overflow, your, the kingdom of God would move in and throughout this world, continually bringing the common grace that you so richly provide through your Holy Spirit and through your people in your church. We pray these things in Jesus' name, amen.